Paul David Sanders was a 17-year-old from Mesa, Arizona. He was originally from Missouri and very athletic. On August 14, 2001, someone, the person may or may not have been Paul, driving Paul's truck was pulled over by law enforcement in Tucson. A chase ensued in which the driver escaped. The truck was later found wrecked several miles away with no signs of Paul. He was never seen again. I'm Ed Denzel, and this is Unfound. As you heard in the intro, the episode today will be based on a disappearance that seemingly started as a chase. So I'll give you a quick quiz. Which two other episodes Unfound has produced also involved people trying to get away from law enforcement? Sure, we've had some walk-offs or run-offs where family or friends tried to go after the missing people. Some of those examples would be Renee LaManna, Keith Fetter, and Riles Chapman. But by my calculations, we've only had two episodes where people went missing after being chased by the cops. A hint, one of those episodes involves two people. The answers, Molly Miller and Colt Haynes, two very well-known disappearances, and probably the lesser-known one, Brennan Smokey. Remember his? There was actually a video of him running into the woods beside the highway with police bearing down on him and the guys who were with him. Now you remember. Well, today, with the disappearance of Paul Sanders, his is not as clear-cut as the other two. In fact, over 20 years later, no one is sure who started that hot pursuit. And now a summary of the case. This is brought to you by my friend Megan Lyonez's website, charlieproject.org. Paul Sanders started his life in Missouri, living with his sister and mother. He played sports. Paul didn't get into much trouble. He was doing well. Then in 2000, Paul decided he wanted to get to know his father, Robert, who lived in Arizona, a little better. Against his mother's better judgment, she allowed Paul to go to Mesa to see how things would work out. At the beginning, everything seemed fine. Paul went to school, made friends, and worked part-time for his father. However, as the year turned to 2001... Paul's attitude had definitely changed. Not to the point, though, that he ever talked about moving back to Missouri. So, on August 14, 2001, near Tucson, Arizona Highway Patrol attempted to pull over a pickup whose driver committed some type of traffic infraction. The truck belonged to Paul's father, and it was the one Paul usually drove. The unseen driver pulled to the side for only a second, then sped off. Police gave chase, but then called it off due to a rare, strong thunderstorm. A day later, August 15th, a landowner near the Santa Catalina Mountains, miles from Tucson, found the same pickup wrecked on his property. A search was done of the area, but no signs of Paul or anyone else were found. Paul was never seen again. Car chases seem to be one of those things that are uniquely American. Really, how many videos are there on YouTube that show helicopter shots of a driver fleeing from police in Germany or Italy or Japan? Yeah, not too many. So then it shouldn't be a surprise that once in a while, a chase is connected to a disappearance. 
So let's try to figure out what happened by trying to answer these three questions. Number one, whether the driver was Paul or not, why was his truck on a highway 90 minutes from where he lived? Number two, if Paul was driving, he had no outstanding warrants and his license was not expired and nothing illegal was found in the truck. So why did he choose to flee? And number three, no one in Paul's family smokes. So then why were cigarettes found in the wrecked truck? The only person in Paul's family who actively works on trying to figure out what happened is his sister, and her only concern is solving Paul's disappearance. The guest for this episode is Paul's sister, Jessica Porter. Unfound News The latest episode of Unfound on the Ground has been made public on YouTube. This is a forum that premium Patreon supporters get to take part in as part of their membership. Please watch slash listen to the latest on the ground and consider becoming a Patreon supporter. Next, did you have a chance to read the article at Narratively written by Dylan Taylor Lehman regarding the Steve Pankey trial and the interview he did with me at the time? I thought it came out really well. Just go to narratively.com to read it. Finally, yes, the rumors are true. I won my division in a disc golf tournament this past weekend at Estero, Florida. It was the first time I won outright with no ties since March of 2015. Wow, it's a great feeling. Where you can find Unfound. Unfound supports accounts on iTunes, Pandora, Audible, Podomatic, Spotify, iHeart, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, Deezer, and YouTube. Speaking of YouTube, on Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern, please join us for the Unfound live show. Watch, ask questions, and give the show a thumbs up. Contribute to Unfound at patreon.com forward slash unfound podcast. This week, I need to thank Kelly. You can also contribute at PayPal, paypal.me forward slash unfound podcast. I also need to give a huge shout out to all the people who have monetarily contributed using Super Chat during the live show on Wednesday nights. Thank you for watching and thank you for donating. The email address, unfoundpodcast at gmail.com. Merchandise, the books at amazon.com in both ebook and print form. Do not forget the reviews. The website, theunfoundpodcast.com. And please mention Unfound at all true crime websites and forums. Thank you. I'm so happy to have on this episode of Unfound the sister of Paul Sanders, Jessica. Porter. Jessica, welcome to Unfound. Thank you. Let's start here uh, as we usually do when we have family members on the program. Let's just talk a little bit about your family and let's start here. Of course, Paul is your brother. Do you have any other siblings, half-siblings? Let's just start with that. Um, I do not. Um, Paul, we have different dads. He does have... um, one brother from his dad's side. Okay. All right. So really then, uh, did you all three, uh, of course, we're going to talk about Paul eventually going to Arizona, but did all of you three live together or was it just Paul and you together? Was he and his other brother together? How was it when you were kids? No, it was just Paul, myself, and my mom Mm -hmm. uh, growing up. Okay. And you are, I know you are uh, Paul's younger sister. Um, How much younger and how old were you at the time of his disappearance in 2001? Sure. Um, We are five years apart and Mm -hmm. I was 12 at the time Paul disappeared. Okay. So for the listeners, just understand that as we are going through this, that 
Um, Jessica wasn't even a teenager yet, and so a lot of the work that she's done had to wait until she became uh, an adult. So that's also, of course, what we're going to be talking about for this interview. Uh, let's talk about uh, your home life in Missouri. Uh, how did you and Paul get along, you being that so many years younger? Were you close at all? Um, did he have his friends? I'm guessing you had your friends. How would you describe your home life in Missouri, maybe in the late 1990s, and, um, you know, with your mother as well? It's kind of hard to remember with it being that far back, uh, mm -hmm. but it's, it's pretty much typical brother, little sister relationship. Um, he would have his friends over, and I would pester them, and he would... Huh. Pay me in candy and slide Skittles under the door, so I would uh -huh. leave them alone. Yeah. Um, but we do board games and stuff like that. Pretty, pretty normal stuff. Mm -hmm. Did you say Skittles? Yes, he would slide <laughs> Skittles under uh, the bottom of the door. I love it. I love Skittles. That's cool. Okay, good. I'm sure some of the listeners love Skittles, too. Okay, yeah. uh, so you were in a single-parent family, your mother, single mother? Yeah, she had mm -hmm. kind of an on-and-off-again marriage for a while, but pretty much it was just us, us three. Okay, okay. Did, 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 does that mean you and uh, Paul maybe found a lot of times you home by yourselves, or uh, what kind of... Um, you know, home life, do you have, did you have their uh, mother around a lot or working a lot? How was it? She worked um, several jobs, so a lot of times it was just Paul and I was and it? home okay. together. Okay. Well, let's talk about Paul. And we realized that you were not around him for that last uh, small portion before he went missing because he had gone to Arizona. We'll be talking about that. But... When you were around him all the time in Missouri, what can you tell the listeners about him as far as personality, school, was he into sports interests? You talked about friends of his coming over. What would they do? What, you, what would you say about him, just to give a well-rounded picture of him? Yeah, um, again, he was pretty normal. Uh, he was huge into sports. He played pretty much everything that he could and mm. excelled in every sport. Um, he was funny. He loved the Lakers. Um, mm -hmm. Loved Michael Jordan. Pretty much everything revolved around sports for him. And he was just starting to get into where he was talking to girls and stuff. So that was mm -hmm. okay. Uh, and we. Pretty, Pretty normal. Okay. And we have to remember, he was uh, just 16 years old when he went missing in 2001, right? Or how, uh, how old was he? How old was 17. he? 17 when he went missing. Okay. And so you knew him uh, before he went to Arizona. So in his pre, uh, you know, in those middle teen years, 15, 16 years old, something like that. Correct. Okay. All right. So into sports, uh, any idea how he uh, did in school? Um, I, you know, usually people who are into sports are fairly outgoing people, but maybe he was a little more laid back. Uh, what can you say about those topics? He was pretty laid back. I know that he did not, did not like school. He, mm -hmm. as far as like learning and stuff like that, he struggled a lot with school work. Mm -hmm. Um, okay. But he was, I know he was held back. Oh, At a well. younger age, I don't know what age it was, but wow. okay. How would you say the relationship was between Paul and uh, your mother? Pretty good, um, for mm -hmm. the most part. I know towards the end, um, Paul kind of wanted to get to know his dad, and I think he was just missing having that. Um, mm -hmm relationship I guess you'd say but for the most part it was pretty good okay so he's missing like a father figure in his life yeah I, I looking back I, yeah. I think so yeah maybe at uh, your age when he was still in Missouri maybe you being 10 or 11 maybe that's not something that would have been uh, understandable to you but maybe as a grown woman now maybe you know looking back that maybe it makes a lot of sense 
Okay, I, okay, I think we can uh, understand a, a lot about that. So let's move into that. Would you say that is uh, the main reason then that he wanted to move to Arizona to live with his father? What you know, realizing you were just ten or eleven at the time when this decision was made, and, or maybe what you've learned about it since. What can you say about what do you think eventually brought on uh, him moving to Arizona to live with his father? Um, he didn't really know his dad at all. I mean, they never talked on the phone or anything like that growing up. And I think he was just at that age where, of course, he needed a mother. But I think, like you had said, I think the father role was really missing mm-hmm. for him um, to kind of guide him through mm-hmm. the male aspect of yeah. Things versus just um, mom. Okay. Do you, uh, maybe you didn't realize at the time, but maybe since then, did you find out whether his father, of course, he eventually did go to Arizona, so I guess his father did say yes, but do you know now if that was like a quick decision, like his father said, oh, absolutely, yeah, sure, or do you think it was a little more drawn out than that? Do you even know that now? I do not. I know that. When my brother mentioned interest, which I don't know if my brother brought that up or his father mm-hmm. initiated it, but my mom had sought out legal counsel of some sort, um, and they just recommended with the age he was at that it was best to let him do that because coming up, he'd be able to do that regardless. and. She mm. thought there might be some resentment if she didn't allow him oh, to get to know his dad. All right. Uh, so when after he moved, you continued to live with your mother, just the two of you? Correct. And if, if you can say, how did your mother uh, react after Paul left? I mean, uh, like you said, you know, maybe she didn't want to get into in the way of that for, you know, very good reasons, but... Uh, Do you think that she was supportive of that? Did you think that, uh, you know, it's not going to work out and Paul would be coming back to Missouri very quickly? Do you even know how your mother, what your mother was thinking at the time? I know she was not supportive of it. She um, told Paul that she thought, didn't think that his father was the best person and Mm -hmm. kind of didn't want, didn't want to tell Paul what, her opinion directly was of him. She didn't want to influence him, but she also didn't want him to be in a bad environment, I guess. Okay. Okay. So when did this, so what you're saying is essentially being that you said that he, uh, Paul and his father really didn't have much, much, much communication at all. So it was just like, just one day I'd like to go, live with my father in Arizona, and it eventually happened. And so the two of them really did not know each other that well until Paul went to Arizona. In your opinion, is would you say that's true? Correct. Uh, my mom and Paul's dad were high school sweethearts, and oh. shortly after Paul was born, they mm. separated. So my mom really okay. hadn't spoke to him much since... During that time, anyways, either. Okay. All right. So he's going to move to Arizona. Of course, we know Arizona and Arizona, Missouri are not uh, very close to each other. Uh, many miles. I've driven between those states a couple times, so I know. And so he goes to Arizona. And when did this happen? When did he move to live with his father? I. It would have been two thousand. Mm-hmm. I want to. Th- summer of 2000, but I'm not, I'm not positive on the month. Okay, so let's just say in the year 2000. So let's just say approximately a le- at least a year before he went missing? Mm-hmm. Okay, because he went missing in August of 2001. Okay, so um, he goes there, and so it's just you and your mother, and uh, was, once again, the way, you, what you know now, was... Uh, his father, what is his father's name? Maybe we'll just use his first name. What is uh, Paul's father's first name? Robert. Okay. Was Robert uh, 
married? Did he have any, any kids that were already living with him in Arizona from maybe another relationship? Uh, did he have a fiance, girlfriend? What was the living arrangement uh, in Arizona? I know he had a fiance at one point and they did get married. I don't know at what mm -hmm. point or what stage they got married. Okay. Um, and she did have a, the fiance did have a daughter. Okay. And uh, once again, uh, lived at home with them? Mm -hmm. Okay. So. Paul was moving in with his father, his father's fiance, and the fiance's daughter. So it would have been four of them. Correct. Okay. After Paul moved to Arizona, I realize you weren't there. Uh, did you talk to him on the phone? Of course, at that point, 2001, we have the internet. Maybe before Facebook. I don't know if MySpace was yet a thing, but... Did you call, uh, call talk, ever talk to him on the phone during that year? Did you ever email back and forth with him, you personally? Um, I didn't have email or social media. We just communicated over the phone. Okay. And how many times did you say you talked to him in that next year? Just a um, I'd say at least once a week. Wow. Okay. And um, in your opinion, for, once again, from a 10, 11-year-old point of view, 12-year-old's point of view, uh, how was he doing? How did he sound? Um, at first, I mean, he sounded pretty happy. He was getting mm -hmm. to know his dad and other family members that he didn't know before, and, mm -hmm. and he sounded pretty good. Okay. And would you say when you were, if you were speaking to him once a week, would you say that he was speaking to your mother once a week as well? Less? More? Yeah, I pretty much always initiated with him talking to my mom and then okay. her kind of handing me the phone. Okay. So he's keeping in touch with you and his mother, your mother too. And so that sounds uh, healthy to me. Uh, and so we went to Arizona, if it was during the summer, did that fall of 2000, did he end up, uh, enrolling in school there? You said he was into sports. Did he get into sports, uh, when he was there playing football or, or whatever else? I believe so, but I'm not 1000% positive on that. I know that mm -hmm. the day he went missing, he was supposed to have football practice. And I have asked for clarification. I'm not sure if he ever showed up to that. All right. And that that would be for 2001. But for 2000, um, if he was 16, what would that be? Uh, sophomore in high school? Just a guess? Yes. Okay. So... All that I don't know. Okay. But um, I guess when I'm maybe I'll just put... So. All right, maybe I'll just put it this way. Being that you were talking to him once a week, did he ever talk about being in any sports activities, uh, any sorts of hobbies, interests of what he was doing once he got to Arizona? I know that he played some sports. I, mm -hmm. I don't remember what kind he played. He, mm -hmm. When he lived in Missouri, played any sport he could. Yeah. So I assume he just did as much as he could, but I don't recall. Okay. Uh, did he talk about making friends there? Would you say Paul was the type of guy who could make friends easily? Yeah, he was a little quiet at first, but then he'd open mm -hmm. up and everybody pretty much wanted to be friends with him. Okay. All right, so he uh, goes to Arizona, living in the Mesa, Arizona area, living with his father, uh, living with his father's fiance and her daughter who um did you say is younger than paul did you say like she was eight years old did you say she's in between paul and i's age oh, so okay. she'd be two or three years right. younger than paul okay very good so he goes when he's 16 so maybe she's 13 14 okay yeah about that all right so um he's there and you said at the beginning he seemed Okay, but um, over time, would you say, in your opinion, once again, as an 11-year-old, 12-year-old, uh, would you say that his opinion changed the longer he lived there? Yes. Okay, just maybe in general talk about that. What, what in 
did he say about living there? Um, you know, anything else maybe that was bothering him that he ever told you? That he told me directly? Yeah, um, please, please. I guess what I'm asking is if, you know, it started out well and you, you kind of insinuated that maybe over time that next year before he went missing, maybe things weren't as good. Uh, mm -hmm. What gave you that impression that they weren't as good? Um, it used to be kind of where Paul and my mom would talk on the phone openly and then I got to where my mom would tell me, like, go in the other room or... Mm. She would go in the other room, and I could hear her part of the conversation. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it was her being worried about different situations, <clears throat> which I didn't find out what they were until much later. Okay. All right. So over time, things changed. Of course, you've already mentioned that your mother... Did not think it was the greatest idea in the world for him to go to Arizona, and maybe it could be that her suspicions were being proven right. That could be it. Correct. Okay. Um, let's move on to this. Now, later, once you um, you know, became an adult, and of course now I know that you've done other interviews, I've read some of them, and you're now on Unfound, you've been able to find out maybe some of these things that were going on with him in Arizona. And I just want to touch upon some of them. And I uh, wanted, if you could, reveal how you found out these things, um, being that you weren't there in Arizona in the early 2000s. Uh, is there a belief that at some point while Paul was in Arizona that he got into taking drugs? I have heard from multiple people um, that he was taking drugs and mm -hmm. uh, also selling drugs by, wow. like, an ex-girlfriend, a family mm -hmm. member, and a friend. Wow. But as far as anything official, yeah. I have not been told that. Okay, so in, in you trying to find out what happened to your brother, Paul, you've tracked down some of these people and this is what they've told you. Correct. Okay. And these were people who are around Paul in Arizona in 2001. Yes. Okay. All right. Um, do your knowledge, did they ever tell you, did he ever get in any problems with the law because of this? Uh, do you think that his father knew about these things? Did you get that impression from these people that you talked to or not? Uh, do, or do you not know? Um, as far as legal trouble, not that I'm aware of. I don't know with his age if, I don't mm -hmm. know how that part works. Um, mm -hmm. But as far as I know, there was no legal trouble. Okay. Um, but I did find out later that his father did know about some of the drug mm -hmm. um, accusations. Okay. All right, and uh, I have to ask, being that you were around him until he moved to Arizona, is that news that surprises you, or does it not surprise you? I would never have believed that before. Okay, okay. so... But with multiple people saying mm -hmm. it, you kind of... Yeah. yeah, you have to maybe think that it's probably true, but you, what you're saying, yes. the way you knew Paul in Missouri, that was uh, that would have been surprising to you. Yes. Okay. Let's move on to this. Now, there was a, a story you told me about a tattoo that he got. Maybe you can explain that tattoo, what the tattoo said, and uh, why his father hated it. How did you find out about all of this? Why did he uh, choose to get that word as the tattoo? Why don't we talk about that right now? Okay. Um, Paul... Again, like I said, he was wanting to get to know his family and where he came from. Um, and his father's father, biological father, his last name was Hernandez. Um, from what I've gathered, Robert was not close to his biological father at all and kind of kind of despised him. Um, huh. And my brother was wanting 
to get into like ancestry and stuff like that and wanting to get to know that side and um when he he came home over christmas break so it would have been 2000 Mm -hmm. um and he asked my mom about getting that Hernandez tattoo on his back and kind of told her why. And she took him and he got that tattoo on his back. And when he went back to Arizona, wow. Robert was furious that he wow. put that on his back. All right. So not only did he get this tattoo, but he got it when he went back to Missouri to see you and your mother. Yes. Oh, my gosh. I have to ask, do you think he got it done there because he knew that if he tried to get it done in Arizona, he wouldn't be able to? Is yes. That a, is that a possibility? Okay. Yeah, and I assume he probably wouldn't be able to get a tattoo because of his age mm-hmm. without a parent, but I, mm-hmm. I'm not sure what the age in Arizona is. And so this was across his back. Are you saying like in big letters like uh, like they put on the back of like sports jerseys, something like that? Yeah, it was like old English lettering, kind of. Oh, my gosh. It's across, completely across, like, shoulder blade to shoulder blade. Oh, my gosh. Okay. Uh, and we have to remember he was uh, 16 or 17 years old when this was done? Yes. Okay. And like you said, uh, he came back there. His father uh, hated it, and you said this was uh, this cr- Christmas break, so December of uh, 2000. So at least eight months before he went missing, uh, his father sees it. He hates it um, because he, I guess, did not get along with his own father, whose last name was Hernandez. So there was something going on there. Do you think uh, the way you, the best you can tell was this something that continued to be an issue uh, with them, or was that something to the the point where Robert just said, "Well, that's just the way it is. We we'll have to move on to other things." Um, to this. This year, Robert is still upset about the tattoo. Is it to this year, 20 years later? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, you know, I'm not a parent, but I have no tattoos. I'm 51 years old. I, I have to admit that I'm not the biggest fan of them. Uh, but uh, some other people are. I, I suppose I might react like Robert did if I had a son who did that. But okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, especially if he's 16, 17, if he's 20 years old, uh, living on his own, what are you going to do? Okay. Mm-hmm. Let's move on to this. Just in general, Robert's, or I'm excuse me, just in general, Paul's mental health. When he was home, for example, you got to see him at Christmas. Um, besides maybe maybe the, the, the relationship with his father continuing to sour, I, of course, would not call that a mental health issue. Anything else maybe that uh, you could tell on the phone, that your mother could tell on the phone, like anxiety, depression, anything like that that was going on with him going into the year 2001? I did not notice anything myself. Um, Mm -hmm. My mother never directly mentioned anything, but I kind of got the feeling that towards um, the beginning of 2001 and on, it Mm kind of started to shift and Paul had some worries or Maybe in, later in 2001, maybe not the beginning of the year. Okay. Anything in particular, uh, um, anything that, that just jumps out at you now? Maybe even it's something maybe that you found out since 2001 in your own work that you've done. Uh, any talk, uh, maybe just to be honest, any talks of suicide or just saying, man, I'm really down and can't shake it, anything like that or you know, something else? No. Okay. Just general worries about things, nothing Mm -hmm. extreme, like not being able to go on type. Okay. And your understanding is 2000 into 2001, he was going to school? Correct. Okay. All right. So we come up to, uh, we know, now. so we've talked about these things, and if we're to believe them, um... Paul may be being a little rebellious with uh, the tattoo. Um, and if we believe these people who knew him at this time, at that time, maybe he was getting into some drugs. Maybe that could have contributed to the, maybe a change in his personality and how he was talking going into 2001, as we know drugs can do. We're just still not sure about that. 
But that brings us to uh, that summer and moving into August of 2001. Maybe we'll just go for the, the summer as a whole, like after school was over. Do you have any idea how Paul spent his time during the summer of 2001 before August came around? Uh, he worked for his father um, doing construction. Okay. All right. So maybe, uh, you know, father has a son working for him. Maybe the relationship wasn't so bad. Um, and uh, construction's uh, a good job for uh, a young uh, kid to have, I guess. Maybe better than some other work. So maybe that's not uh, a bad deal. So he's working in, in construction. Obviously, working construction in Arizona is not for the faint of heart, given the temperatures and everything. I haven't been in Arizona a lot of times in my life. So he's working for his father, and uh, we get to August of 2001. Now, my understanding, though, is at the time, seemingly at the time of Paul's disappearance, Robert and his fiance weren't even in Arizona. Where were they? Um, in Vegas is what I'm being told. Okay. You were able to find that out? Who, who told you that? The um, investigator had mentioned that. Mm-hmm. Um, and a family member had mentioned that. But mm-hmm. as far as knowing what they did there, I, I don't know if any okay. of that. Okay. Now, you, of course, you mentioned that the fiancé has a daughter of her own. Did she stay at home like Paul did, or did she go to Las Vegas with the two of them? Do you even know? She did not go to Vegas. Um, I know um, she saw Paul on August 12th, which is when they were in Vegas. Um, mm-hmm. I think she went to her grandma's home, but I'm not positive. Uh, okay. So it's not like um, father and uh, the, the fiancé go to Vegas and Paul and the sister are kind of just hanging out the house by themselves or, or doing whatever. It may be that the the sister did go to live with somebody else. Correct. It's right. just Paul. All right. So Paul. Paul had the run of the house to himself in Mesa. Correct. Okay. Uh, do you even have any idea what date uh, Robert and his fiance went to Vegas? Do you have any, any records on that? No, my understanding was they had just recently went to Vegas for like a short trip. Okay, so it could be they went there on the 10th or 11th, something like that. Correct. Okay. All right, let's move to this uh, on August 12th, which I think uh, I I, I looked this up. I think this was a Sunday. Um, If not, I will correct it. But Paul went to see... His grandmother. Now, this would be Robert's mother. Yes. Okay. What do you? What have you? What did you? Uh, do you know about it? What have you found out about this visit that Paul made to his grandmother? Um, I know his Robert Paul's father um, told me that he came to visit her, and I don't know if. Paul told her or how she found out that she told Robert that he Mm -hmm. that she found out Paul had bought a hundred dollars worth of speed that day. Wow. And I again I don't know how that was passed from person to person. That's just what Mm -hmm. I was told is that she knew he had made that purchase. How would a grandmother yeah, have you thought about that? You've had, probably had some time to think about that, Jessica. How would a grandmother yeah. even know that her grandson bought speed, especially whether it's one dollar or a hundred dollars? How would a grandmother even know that? I mean, was does that sound like something Paul would tell her? No, I thought that was really strange. I don't know how much <laughs> I, I. It just does not seem like something you visit your grandma and say. Yeah, hey, I, I just agree. Went to the store and. Got this for $100. You're yeah, right. I mean, you'd, she'd have to be a really progressive uh, grandma to be able to tell her that. I don't know if she found out or someone mm-hmm. else told her, maybe. I don't know okay. if it came directly from Paul. Okay. Uh, I don't know what to think about that, but that is coming from Robert, right? 
Correct. Now, that information about the speed and everything is coming from Robert. And I think, you know, I don't know, and the listeners probably will figure out before this interview is over. We, we're not sure if Robert is a reliable, narr- what we might call a reliable narrator in all of this. But there is uh, some sort of proof that Paul did go see his grandmother on August 12th. Do you know how often uh, he would go see her? Did you ever find that out later? And unfortunately, she's deceased, right? Correct. She mm-hmm. passed in 2019, December mm-hmm. of 19. Mm-hmm. Um, and from my understanding, um, mm-hmm. they had a good relationship. Of mm-hmm. course, he didn't live with her or anything, but mm-hmm. my understand was, understanding was they talked regularly. Okay. I don't know how often, but it wasn't. Once every six months or anything, it was more frequent. Okay. Did you ever have a chance to talk to her before she died? I did not. You never uh, never spoke to her at all? Not not about Paul, really. Oh, okay. Uh, she is on my social media, and there would mm. be comments back and forth on mm. Paul's Facebook page, but nothing about details mm. of the case or anything. Okay. And we have to remember, uh, she's not actually related to you, right? She's Robert is not your father. Correct. Right, so she's not really related to you anyway. So she's almost like uh, just an old person that you know well, something like that. Yeah. Okay, so she, Paul goes over there. Uh, Robert and his fiancée are in Las Vegas. Maybe uh, Paul went over there. I'm just throwing this out as an, as an example. Maybe he's going over there for a home-cooked meal. You know, we, we don't know. I know That's something probably I would do. Uh, and I had grandparents uh, that lived close to me back when I lived in Pennsylvania. That's probably what I would do. My parents were out of town. So he goes there, spends uh, some time with her like any young man should. But we move into August 13th. And to this day, do we know, and this is, I think, a Monday, do we know anything about Paul's movements that day at all of course we're going to get to the next day we certainly know a lot about that day but this day in between the grandmother visit and uh the chase this august 13th do we know anything about that day nothing at all i have asked a few people and have been told no they don't know or Mm -hmm. they don't remember which because of the time that Mm -hmm. both might be accurate yeah it's been 20 years ago and, yeah. you know, once you started working on this, um, you know, it would have been a few years. And that's probably not the type of question that the police would ask anybody, no matter how well they're involved. So, but would this have been a day, of course, it's summer, there wouldn't have been school, but uh, presumably would there have been a football practice, something like that, do you think? Yes, I, I don't remember who told me this but I've always mm. been under this impression from way back when that there were football tryouts mm. that day and I have asked several people if he showed up to football practice or football oh. tryouts mm. and have not got a clear answer okay all right so we know about the August 12th but we know nothing about August 13th so it very well may be that he went to this football practice and nobody, you know, I don't know if that's the kind of stuff would be written down anyway, or maybe he didn't go at all, maybe he hung out at home. If he was doing, in, getting into drugs and those things, of course, you know, it's a combination, maybe some facts there, maybe some rumor there as well, maybe he was doing that, but we just have no information on August 13th. So we move on to August 14th. And we just have to remember something. Paul was living with his father and uh, the fiance in Mesa. And those, this happened in Tucson, which is nowhere near uh, Mesa, Arizona. Mesa's, you know, getting up there near um, Phoenix, whereas Tucson's getting down there kind of closer to Mexico. Um, what do you know uh, about that day? And, of course, we have to remember, uh, we're going to kind of give this away, we're not sure Paul was in his own truck or not, but what do we know about Paul's truck in that day? Um, the truck was pulled over. It was his father's truck, but Paul primarily drove it. Robert had his own truck, and this was kind of an additional one. 
Paul went place to place in. Okay. Um, so he was the primary driver. Um, the truck was pulled over. I don't know if it was by state or what jurisdiction, but it was pulled over for something routine and minor, like a tail light or blinker signal. I'm not sure what. Okay. I was just told it was something minor. Okay. Um, and the vehicle took off. There was a chase. They went through a really large jurisdiction. Um, I think maybe five agencies. Oh my! Approximately that this chase went through, um, and ultimately it was called off because of the weather and public safety concern. Huh. Is what I was told, and there was not a helicopter. Okay. So maybe to give uh, an example to the listeners, this sounds like a serious long chase, like one of those that you might see uh, on YouTube or something like that. You know, you can go on and watch police chases. Of course, those have helicopters that are falling. doesn't sound like there was a hot, uh, helicopter here. But one of those long chases that goes out in the highway, reaching excessive speed, something like that. Yes? Yes. All right. Okay. So that's the kind of chase it was. And, but believe it or not, uh, even though it hardly ever rains in uh, that portion of Arizona, this uh, chase was called off because of rain. Correct. Okay. Uh, just asked you some questions, though. Your understanding, did the officer who pulled the truck over ever see the driver? Not that I'm aware of, no. Okay. Um... At the time, when it was pulled over, do you, did the police know that it was Paul's truck? Did they like run the license plate? Or it was it? Do you even know if it happened so quick that they could even run the license plate? Or what? Do you, what about that? On um, that, I'm not too sure. I don't know if mm -hmm. they had, like stopped behind the truck and then were walking up when the truck took off, or mm -hmm. if they had just. Put their brakes on behind the truck, mm. and then it took off. I'm not sure mm. how long mm. it took if they had time to run the plates. Okay. So... I believe so, that they did, but I'm not positive. Okay. So, for the listeners, uh, once again, Paul and his family live in Mesa, but for some reason, Paul's truck, once again, nobody saw him driving it, Paul's truck is down in Tucson. The driver of this truck did something, maybe speeding, maybe, like you said, uh, you know, not using your turn signals, something. Maybe he pulled in front of somebody we don't know, but uh, tries to get pulled over. The truck takes off, police chase, and eventually they have to give it up because they're worried about maybe other people getting hurt. And so whoever was in the truck got away. But what happened then the next day? That would be August 15th. What happened? Um, the truck was located. Um, a property owner um, on the near the Santa Catalina Mountains had pulled in. They had found the truck, mm -hmm. crashed, and my understanding was it was like, I can't think of the word. <laughs> Was it was it was it totaled? Was it wrecked? Um, was it drivable? Was it like off on a dirt road? How far was it from a main road? Maybe that'll help you with that word you're looking for. Um, I was told it had rolled. It was wow. totaled. Um, it was on Reddington Pass Road mm -hmm. at mile marker forty four, mm -hmm. um, about six miles from a reservation and. That part I learned from Robert. Okay. So, and I will be doing a video, uh, everyone, uh, so we can I can show you some of these locations. Uh, Mesa, Arizona, Tucson, Arizona, and then this Reddington Road and the Santa Catalina Mountains. Um, I'll be doing a video that will be on YouTube for all of you to check out. And we should just state, the Sa Santa Catalina Mount Mountains aren't near Tucson or near Mesa. It's like one big triangle. Correct? Yeah. Okay. So, in your opinion, 
uh, was the truck found, like, I guess by mistake. Yes. By accident. Um, it wasn't like the police were still looking for this truck and happened upon it way up there. It was some private individual who saw that it had been wrecked, rolled over, or whatever. Mm-hmm. On okay. his property. Okay. So your understanding, once again, I realize that uh, you didn't do a chance to do this research and work until years later, but uh, the next few days, how did you and your mother find out about all of this? That part is honestly kind of foggy for some reason. Um, Mm -hmm. I don't, my memory of it was that my mom had been calling maybe Robert because she hadn't heard from Paul in a while. Um, I'm not entirely sure. I know that when I spoke to the investigator, um, she had said that they, my mom had called them and then they were trying to reach Robert to find out if he knew Paul's whereabouts, um, anything like that. But They weren't able to reach him initially, but she was, I just remember she kept saying, oh God, I know something, something's not right. Mm -hmm. So do you even know, was it the police or was it Robert who called her to tell her that the truck had been wrecked and Paul was missing? Do you know? I believe it was the police, but I am not Mm. positive on that. Okay. And your mother actually went out to Arizona, didn't she? Yes. Okay. How do you even remember? I'm guessing you didn't go. Did were you uh, put with uh, somebody, a family member, to watch you while she went out there? Uh, we didn't have too much family, so I mm. did go with her. Oh, you did. You went to Arizona. Yes. Wow. Okay. What do you remember uh, personally? I realize you're just uh, like uh, 12 years old. Uh, what do you remember about going there? Uh, I know. We, and again, that's, I, the next few days are really blurry. Um, Mm -hmm. She went to the police department and was talking to them and she was really frustrated. Um, They kind of were using the term runaway. um, And she kept saying, that's not what this is and kind of caused a scene. Um, Mm -hmm. And basically got onto her and Mm -hmm. I remember that part and I know we somehow we got flyers I don't know if that was through the police department or what and had Mm -hmm. were putting flyers at uh, missing persons flyers for Paul I don't remember how long we were down there but I want to say it was a few days and then Mm -hmm. returned back okay now, to remind the listeners, of course, Robert and his fiance were not even in Arizona when this all went on. Um, did they cut their Vegas trip short to come back, or what do you know about that? Um, when they, they had tried calling Robert um, to find out if they heard from Paul, and then they found the truck. They mm. called Robert, notified Robert. Mm-hmm. He called them back. Um, and was came back home. Um, sorry. It's all right. Um, he came back home, and they told him that they would form a search party in the morning when the weather was better and when it was daylight. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so uh, the police, uh, maybe if the truck was found on the 15th, uh, so you believe approximately on the 16th or the 17th, uh, they sent some searchers out into the, those mountains to find out if they could find uh, Paul, any items that he might have, uh, anything that could be connected to him to maybe lead them in a direction that he might have gone, anything like that. Correct. Okay. I don't know if how actively the search was or Mm -hmm. if there were people. um, Robert had went to the truck without law enforcement. Um, 
before the search party occurred. Okay. Uh, I have a question for you. If you don't know it, that's totally fine. Do you know, uh, once the truck was found, do you think that there was an immediate, the police made an immediate connection between the car, the truck they found in the Santa Catalina Mountains being rolled over and the police chase that had occurred the day before way down there in Tucson? Was, do you think that connection was made fairly quickly? Do you even know? I don't know. I with it being so many, if it was a like nearby agency, I would think mm-hmm. so. But with it being so many mm-hmm. departments in between, I don't know how the communication right. was between all those departments. Okay. All right. So this uh, landowner finds the truck, calls the police. They show up. Eventually, it is uh, the, the connection is made. Who uh, this truck was, and uh, you know who tr- owns the truck, and then sometime after that, there was this connection made between this chase and that truck, although we have no idea if Paul was in his truck or not. And Robert comes back, whether he cut this trip short or not, he comes back with his fiance to Arizona to being that it's his truck and it's his son. He comes back, your mother and you go out there, everybody's involved. Searches are done. And of course, this disappearance is still unsolved over 20 years later. And, you know, and looking at the map, it's not the... Um, Easiest ter- terrain to search. In addition, uh, it would have been August in Arizona. And having been there, it's like 115 degrees, which isn't pleasant for anybody. So that doesn't make anything any easier. Okay, so let's move on to uh, some things that I, I, I call the rest of the case. Let's start here. In all the work that you've done trying to figure out what happened to your brother Paul, Uh, Has anybody ever told you, you know what, Paul was very familiar with that Santa Catalina area. He had been out there before. Had he ever driven there before? Has anybody ever told you that in the work that you've done? No. Okay. All right. And once again, from the video that I will do, and if you just want to look at a map for yourself, you will find that Tucson, where the truck was, and where uh, Mesa and these mountains, nowhere near each other. So there's that. Okay, let's talk about the truck. We already know its condition uh, pretty much totaled. What have you learned was in the truck? What were the condition of those things? Like the, uh, his wallet, ID, phone, keys, um, anything like that. What have you found out about the interior of the truck of what was left behind? Um, the window was busted out. There, his driver's license was in his wallet. Um, his cell phone was in the truck. The keys were on the console, and the truck was not flat on the ground. It was like on its, like on the two tires. On its side, kind of like in an angle. Yeah. On, yes. it, on its like two, it's like its right side tires or its left side tires. Correct, and the oh. keys were um, mm. on the dash. Okay, kind of resting on the dash. So they were not in the ignition, which I find uh, interesting. And maybe the reason the window is busted could have busted when the, the truck wrecked or whoever was driving the truck maybe needed to bust a window to get out of it. We don't know. Okay. I don't know if maybe the door was, it was like in between rocks or something yeah. in the mountains and the door wouldn't open. Or That's right. It, it was from rolling. I'm not sure. All right, sure. That's a very good point, too. If the truck got bent in some way, maybe the doors wouldn't open because they were kind of the frame of the truck was kinked. Okay. Um, To your knowledge, uh, any signs that the driver, whoever was driving it, was injured? Any signs of blood? Not to be graphic, but we know in car wrecks and people hit their heads and hit their knees. Uh, Any signs of blood uh, in the truck? And do you know if that was ever tested, if it existed? Um, I, of course, was not there. I did ask someone who did see it, and they stated they don't recall any blood or anything Mm -hmm. abnormal. And I did forget to add there was also um, a hat in the vehicle and cigarettes in the vehicle. All right, did. Along with the wallet. Did, uh, I know he was uh, just 16, 17. Did he smoke? No. He didn't? He did not. Huh. Okay. And this hat, was it his? Can anybody prove 
Uh, any friends or maybe Robert say, yeah, that's Paul's hat, or is that hat a mystery? Um, it was confirmed that was a hat of Paul's that he had recently purchased, and my mm. understanding was it was like his prized, he loved ball caps. It was like his mm-hmm. his baby, his new baby. Okay. All right. Us guys, we, us <laughs> no, guys, us guys in our hats. Okay. Um, most importantly, uh, any thing illegal found in the, in the truck at all, any drugs, any bongs, anything like that, uh, found in the truck, uh, after it was found. Not that I have been told by no. anyone. Okay. Most importantly, uh, of course we know, so what we're saying is, either way, whether Paul was driving the truck or not, it seems a lot of his possessions were in the truck, including his wallet with his ID and his phone, and yes, I guess in 2001, that was before I had a cell phone, Paul had a cell phone in 2001. Yes. All right, it's 16, 17 years old, and I think you told me maybe he used that for work, for his father? Yes. That was something that... He had been given. Okay. So nothing illegal found in in the vehicle, uh, but uh, many of his items were left behind, things that we usually as guys carry on our person. Uh, Any proof someone else could have been driving uh, the vehicle? Maybe the cigarettes could be proof. Uh, Anything else in the vehicle that could have been somebody else's? Not that I'm aware of. Um, Cigarettes Mm -hmm. is the only thing that I would say would be not his, and that has been pretty much anybody that knew Paul, even Mm -hmm. in Missouri and Arizona. He did not smoke cigarettes. My mom smoked like a chimney, and he he just despised cigarette Mm. smoke. Okay. Let's move on to this. Being that he did have this phone, do you know if, uh, granted, uh, maybe our understanding of phones and how they could be used to track people and everything, I wouldn't say it was in its infancy in 2001, but it certainly was maybe a new uh, technology, people still getting used to it, law enforcement uh, getting used to it, using it in investigations. Do you know if any ping info was ever gotten? Do you know if... Paul's records were ever obtained um, from his, you know, whoever was paying for his phone, whether, you know, could they get uh, his phone records somehow to see if he had talked to anybody on the 12th, 13th, 14th? Do you know anything about the ping info or just the, the regular phone info? I don't believe either were done, but I'm not positive on that, and I'm still trying mm-hmm. to get some clarification on what... Mm-hmm exactly was handled with the crash since it was through a different department than mm. the one that handled the missing persons okay. case. So it would seem to me, I think, of course, this was, if this record happened, if this disappearance happened this year, then I think probably fairly quickly uh, somebody would get those records of the person who is missing, would get the ping info, and uh, be able to figure out if Paul went missing in 2022, be able to figure out who did he text, who did he call, what did the ping say, uh, but we're still unclear about that information for his disappearance, which happened in 2001. Mm-hmm. Okay. Do you believe the phone, being that it was still left in the vehicle, do you believe it is still still now with whatever department is responsible for his disappearance? I don't believe so. You don't think so. Okay. But I- Again, not 1,000% positive, but I Mm -hmm. don't believe they have it. So who is responsible for Paul's missing persons case in 2022? Who has the official paperwork uh, that was filled out in 2001 regarding his disappearance? Uh, Mesa Police Department. Okay. And so just to put this together for the listeners, so his truck... so. The chase, whether Paul was in it or not, in the truck or not, was in Tucson. The truck is found in the Santa Santa Catalina Mountains, but it's Mesa who has the report, even though it doesn't seem like Paul disappeared from either of those locations, or or that location. 
Correct. All right. That's, and this is why jurisdictional problems are common in many disappearances. It would seem, I think, for the general public, it would make sense that uh, whoever, whatever jurisdiction is responsible at San Santa Catalina, whatever area that would be, would be responsible for his disappearance. I think that's what the public would think, but that's not how it works. It's amazing how many times they just default to where the person lived. Okay. And the way you know Paul and you, the work you've done uh, since becoming an adult, has anybody ever been able to convey to you or make you understand why, if it was Paul in his truck, what he would be doing down in the Tucson area at all. I know there are a lot of rumors, but anything factual? Nothing. They didn't know him to drive down there, hang out down there, have a girlfriend down there, anything? Nothing at all. Nothing. Okay. But his truck was down there. Mm -hmm. Let's move on to this. Paul's father, Robert. We already talked about how he was in Vegas. He came back. Now, you were told a story about how he went to where the truck was. Why don't you um, talk about that? Um, I was told that the, they had told him, Pima County, where the truck was located, that they would be forming a search party in the morning when there was daylight and the weather was supposed to be better. Um, and he, I don't know how he located the truck, if maybe Pima told him, I'm not mm. sure, but he was able to locate the truck. Um, he, I spoke with him personally, um, mm -hmm. this year about it, and he okay. had said everything was just like I left it, there was seventy dollars and change approximately expensive watches um, in the truck um, and that he someone else who was there had told me that Robert kind of walked around a little bit um, and then notified police that he was at the truck mm -hmm. and I don't know if they met him there or if he left and they met the following morning when the search party was supposed to occur, but he eventually had left. So is it my then understanding, uh, he went, so he's in Las Vegas, but he got back to Arizona so quickly that he went out to where the truck was found, where it was wrecked. Correct. All right. And he went, he, they allowed him to go in the truck. I don't know if they allowed him or if he mm. just took it upon himself. Um, mm. My understanding was he they weren't aware he was going to the mm. truck, but that could be incorrect. I'm not sure. Okay. Do you know if any police officers, any law enforcement was there at all when he showed up at the truck? I was told no. No. All right. So once again, if we're to understand this, private citizen finds the truck on his property Let's police know. The police, I'm guessing, drive out there to check it out. And then they eventually figure out who owns the truck. That would be Robert. He comes back to Las Vegas, so he goes out to the truck, and but nobody's there. They just left the truck there abandoned. I know you weren't there, That's but is that the way you understand it? Yes. Okay. And he said that he found fancy watches in the truck? His expensive watches. His expensive how he, watches. How he ordered it. He had more than one and he kept it in his truck that his son was driving? Yes, and then $70 and change. Mm-hmm. Well, I can believe the 70 bucks, but... <laughs> I mean, once again, who... Uh, who stores their... I, I don't wear watches at all. I've never been into that. But who stores their watches in a pickup truck? I don't know. But that's what he told you. Of course, we were, neither of us were there, but that's what he said. Yes. Okay. I don't know what to think of that. Uh, but uh, you did tell me, did he, was he in the process, as he was driving home, did he tell you or somebody tell you that he was throwing stuff out of the window on the way home? What What is that? What was that story? I was told that he um, started 
throwing pulse positions located in the truck out the window for sure. Um, that brand new hat mm. that was Paul's baby um, through that out the window and just various things. Um, they didn't recall everything specifically, but that he was throwing them out of the window like in mm. anger and had ripped one thing from their hand to throw it out the window. Wow. Okay. All right. Um, do you, uh, maybe you didn't realize that at the time when you were in Arizona, but how much conversation was there between your mother and Robert? Of course, they have this child, Paul, even though they may not get along, but it's both their children. It's both their child, I should say. Um, did your mother ever convey to you how she thought Robert acted, you know, reacted to Paul's disappearance? Um, as an adult, she kind of told me more than she did when I was a child, but mm -hmm. she always said that it wasn't, it was like night and day reaction between hers versus his. Mm -hmm. His was a lot of anger and hers was mm -hmm. more like distraught. Mm -hmm. um, I know they had tried to talk and it just always they always ended up fighting, so eventually they just quit communicating altogether. Okay. Uh, do you know if how much Robert helped in trying to find Paul? Did he go out with any of the search parties? Did he drive around? Did he help? Uh, you talked about putting flyers up. Did he do uh, anything to your knowledge? I don't believe so. I know that he, when he located the truck, did walk around that area for a short amount of time mm -hmm. but to my knowledge that is all he has stated that he has done stuff since day one but i don't know what exactly what exactly he has done okay in talking to robert you've stated that you spoke to him just this past year 2021 Correct. Okay. Um, we started talking in September, mm -hmm. I want to say, of 2021. Okay. Has he ever stated that he thought maybe Paul's disappearance could be connected, could be drug related? Of course, we have these other people who stated that Paul might have been doing this, might have been doing that. Have the topic of drugs ever uh, come up between you and Robert and talking about this disappearance? Um, I let him know that I had been told Paul was using drugs and asked if um, that was true and how he handled that, if it was. And mm -hmm. at first he'd said he wasn't aware of it until after the fact all this happened. Um, but then later he had stated that he found um, weed in Paul's wallet and there was an argument about that, mm -hmm. and Paul had went back at him and said, well, you do it too, why are you oh, I upset see. with these type of scenarios? Okay. All right, so there was that. And maybe I should ask you that. Uh, once uh, everybody uh, did go home, once Robert went back to his house with his fiance, her daughter, of course, Paul's missing... Um, to your knowledge, did they uh, find anything in the house, being that they were gone for a few days, Paul's there by himself, anything that seemed weird, unusual, out of place, missing, um, that could have been connected to Paul's disappearance? No, and when they did um, the official missing persons paperwork, um, when they actually came out to... The home they lived in, um, they the conversation happened outside, and they the law enforcement had not went inside the home mm -hmm. in Paul's room or anything anywhere in the house. Um, and I was told that nobody noticed anything missing or unusual. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Now, we should state for the record, uh, we don't have to get into any specifics, but uh, Robert, um, what kind of reputation does he have? Um, I would not... I would not want to be alone with the type of person that... Is that right? I found out. All right, does he have a criminal record? Does he have felonies on his record for things? Yes, several. Okay. In talking to him, you said you spoke to him this past year. Um, By the way, we are doing this interview for the listeners. We're doing this interview on January 12th, 2022. Um, So maybe uh, four or five months after you started speaking to Robert. Uh, Has he ever, in your talking to him, ever voiced an opinion on what he thinks happened to Paul? He gets a little strange about that. He has kind of leaned towards Paul was in the wrong crowd and he thought a friend knew something um, and kind of never nothing exact, no exact theory. Okay. Okay. Now there's this uh, and this is kind of connected to Robert because of Paul's job, but there is a story about Paul's paycheck. Um, what can you tell the listeners about? He got it. Was it cashed? What do you know about it? How much was it worth? What about this? Um, the, Robert had the construction business and his fiance or wife, I'm not sure at what point they were married. Um, she did the payroll for the business. And Robert said he was not aware of this until after. Um, But Paul had asked her directly if he could get his paycheck a couple days before it would normally be given. I don't know if there Mm -hmm. were questions asked, why, or anything like that. But it was uh, $500 approximately. Mm -hmm. Um, And that was, she had stated that when the missing person's case was going, had let the Mm. cops know, and I don't believe any of that was in the wallet. And so, but you, but so you do believe that, um, he was given a a paycheck and it was cashed. Correct. All right. And that money has never been found except for that $70 you said was in the truck. In change, yes. Okay. So, Paul is missing... His phone was found, wallet was found, keys to the truck were found, but this money that he's uh, allegedly got was not found uh, seemingly, if we're to believe it wasn't found at home, it's never been tracked down. Correct, and it just dawned on me. I don't know if the check was requested to be cashed because they were Mm -hmm. going to be on vacation. I'd never thought of that part or if it was he needed it for something. I hadn't thought of that before. Okay, that's a good point. But either way, he should have had $500 somewhere and uh, hasn't been tracked down. Okay. Now let's talk about, uh, of course, we talked about a lot about Paul and the connection to his father. So we've talked about Paul and this kind of this relationship with his father. We talked about uh, Paul as an individual, and you, but you've also mentioned how you've talked to some people who are around Paul at the time, and there was uh, one person in particular, his initials are M.P. Why don't we talk about your interaction with him? How did you track him down? When did you first speak to him? Let's talk, let's start there. Um, This started just from when Paul had visited us over Christmas break. He talked about his friend. Um, He'd seen photos of them. They Once Paul went missing, uh, I found him on social media, friended him, messaged him, just generic, you know, I'm so-and-so. Have you heard anything? You know, you still live in that area. Basically, can you help me with anything? Um, yeah. And he just kind of got weird about it. What does that mean? Um, he was talking about me 
personally and saying that I could be his Facebook girlfriend and wasn't really discussing Paul. He was discussing me and appearance and wanting to get to know me and not addressing my direct questions. Really? And you're sure yes. and you're sure this was the right guy? Yes. Okay. And I think you've told me that this guy is married? Correct. And he was doing this? Yes. I see. Uh, did you ever get any useful information out of him about Paul's disappearance? Um, well, not actually useful, but it seemed weird. Um, and so I first messaged him in January of 2012. And mm -hmm. we message him every, every so often, um, several times a year. And in 2017, he said, I asked him if anybody had ever reached out to him or if anybody had ever spoken to any of Paul's friends or anything like that. And he said, let me read this. FBI contacted me, but they never actually questioned me. And I asked him what he meant. That didn't make sense. And he said, I know they contacted me, but I never really knew what for. I always assumed it was for him. Mm -hmm. And I asked him to clarify again and didn't get a response. And when was the last time you spoke to him? I spoke with him. I messaged him about mm -hmm. two weeks ago and, and did not get a response. Um, and I had messaged him when there was an article about my brother. Mm -hmm. I want to say maybe six months ago, I sent it to him and didn't get a reply. And I reached out again and said, I know you saw this. Mm -hmm. What do you think? And it was, oh, sorry. Just saw that. That's cool. It wasn't anything but... Huh. Yeah, it's really cool. I would hope if I had a friend, they would say something other than mm -hmm. that. So this um, guy who's supposed to be a friend of Paul's is acting as weird as probably a friend can do. Yes. And Your opinion. I know personally that they were friends because mm -hmm. when Paul came home, he was talking to him. Everybody else I've talked to says... Mm -hmm. They were best friends. It wasn't just a casual, like an acquaintance type mm -hmm. um, situation. And I've just in the last couple of days went through my brother's, it's an inactive um, Facebook profile. And this person and a lot of his family members are on there. Mm -hmm. So... I wouldn't think that'd be a casual acquaintance for you and all your family members. Yeah. Okay. So something, I don't know what to make of that. Uh, I, I, the listeners know, if they've been listening to Unfound for long enough, that um, it's amazing how people who are friends of missing people sometimes are not as helpful as you'd think they'd be. And in fact, some I of them, even though you don't suspect them of anything, still act weirdly. Um, yeah, I did miss one part. Um, Robert had told me that this friend and Paul um, had met at Walmart mm -hmm. on the 12th. And Robert's son from a previous relationship, he's even much younger than me, so he was really mm -hmm. young then. Okay. Um, he stayed in the truck the whole time neither one of the friend or paul went into walmart they just met in the parking lot mm -hmm. and then paul took little brother home or wherever he took him after the fact uh, what happened or why they met i don't know i did ask mm -hmm. a friend 
for clarification, and I didn't get a reply. Well, I know some people, well, that sounds suspicious. I don't know if that's suspicious or not. And, and on top of everything else, coming from someone that was even younger than you at the time, I mean, what are we supposed to take from an eight- or nine-year-old? Exactly. You know, so I don't, I don't know what to make of that. I'm, I'm much more concerned about this MP guy who is an adult when you're talking to him, and you're asking about your missing brother, and, he, you know, and he's making a pass at you. That's just so bizarre. Not hateful. Yeah, so uh, the listeners uh, can uh, figure that into their calculations. Uh, did this person ever even offer up a theory as to what happened to Paul? No. Um, when I asked that, he said that they didn't really hang out. They didn't really know each other well. Even though you have information to the contrary? Correct. Okay. Let's move on to this, and this is something that's just uh, recently, um, given that this disappearance is over 20 years old, um, I'm always hopeful that the police will be a little more forthcoming than they would on disappearances that are just a couple years old. Uh, You were in the process of uh, filling out a Freedom of of Information Act request, correct? Correct. All right, did you... Uh, how did that go filling that out? When did you, did you send it in yet? Um, what can you tell the listeners about it? Um, I did send it in. Um, as far as filling it out, it was very difficult just because I didn't, mm-hmm. I've never done anything like that before. Okay. Um, I don't know if my mother ever did. I, I don't know. Mm-hmm. I, it was completely out of my realm. Okay. I don't have any police reports to go off of or anything no. like that to maybe answer some questions. Okay. So, but you sent it in to the Mesa Police Department? Correct. Okay, and hopefully you will get a response from them. I wouldn't wait too long on that, Jessica. Um, being that this, be uh, this, uh, this is a Wednesday, if you do not hear from them by Friday... I'd be calling them and finding out what the heck's going on, okay? Just because they're supposed to get back to you when they receive it. Correct. Okay? So, um, that's very interesting, and I'm hopeful that that will give you a lot more information. Um, Sometimes FOIAs are helpful, but um, sometimes you don't get anything. Sometimes you get something, and then sometimes you get a lot of the disappearance that we covered... Um, the week before this particular episode, uh, we got a FOIA that was 600 some pages long. So I'm hoping you get something like that. Um, if it's less than that, that would not, that would easily not surprise me, but I'm hoping if you do get it, it's a, a large file that's helpful to you. Okay. And so I think that's very good that you've done that. Now, what is this? Please. Um. The current detective did tell me when we first, I called her on July 5th of 2020 to let her know um, I needed to be the point of contact and asked her questions about Paul and she stated she had just got the case several months prior and his binder was huge compared to mm-hmm. some. So I don't know if that's mm-hmm. a good thing or what necessarily that means. Uh, until you look in it, I don't know what that means until you look into it. So I wouldn't want to yeah. jump to any conclusions regarding that. Okay. Yeah, I can't tell. All you won't know until you actually get to see what's in it. Mm-hmm. Um, what's this been like for you, Jessica? Of course, you were just a, what I would call a little girl, not even a teenager yet. When this happened, and then at some point you become an adult, and then to the point where you're working on this yourself, and it's mainly because um, your mother's passed away since then. Yes, um, it's been kind of all very confusing, Um, Mm -hmm. just because I was not... There, I was little. I don't know yeah. how much my mom 
withheld from me. She really didn't like talking about it after Paul went missing. She was a completely different person. She couldn't handle not knowing where he was, if he was okay. Um, I know for several years, she, every holiday would think that he was coming home and he was going to just show up in the door. And Mm -hmm. when she passed, um, she actually committed suicide and told, um, I did not know until after she was gone. Um, she had told the hospital staff and the paramedics and the officer that came to her house that she um, just wanted to be with her son and know what happened to her son. Um, and mm. when I got her phone, when she passed, that's everything was about my brother and mm-hmm. not knowing what happened. So at that point, I kind of She'd been the main, the only point of contact um, since Paul went missing on the case. And yeah. I called a few days after she passed and talked to the detective, explained that to her, and said that I needed to be the contact for if anything happened or mm-hmm. any questions, anything that could be done. Um, mm-hmm. How long has she been gone, Jessica? Uh, July 2nd of 2020 on her birthday. Oh, my. Okay. Do you have a Facebook page or anything else set up for Paul's disappearance, Jessica? Well, we did. Um, I had a Facebook profile Mm -hmm. that really wasn't working out. I was getting a bunch of spam requests and stuff like that. And someone Mm. had mentioned recently to just do a Facebook page. Right. um, Yes. And it's easier to do. So we, uh, I just started that. Good. Good. Well, tell the listeners what it is right now, please. And it's where is Paul Sanders. Okay. Well, I will make sure, uh, as listeners know, and in the run-up to every episode that comes out on a Friday, I do a lot of uh, posting on Facebook, on Twitter, on our website, uh, elsewhere, regarding the disappearance for that Friday. So I'll make sure that I will link to it so people will know uh, where it is. And um, I'll be doing a a YouTube video, YouTube video um, regarding all these locations that we've talked about, Mesa, Tucson, the Santa Catalina Mountains, uh, to make sure everybody understands uh, the the very spread out, what I would call disappearance. And um, so that will be doing all of that in the run-up to uh, the publication of this episode. But uh, Jessica, I want to assure you uh, that, um, you know, I always want to be a resource for you. Um, Any questions pop up? You know, anybody contacts you contacts you about Paul's disappearance. Of course, there's a lot of scammers out there and all sorts of types. Uh, I want you to know that I'll always be somebody you can trust. So if you need any advice, need somebody to talk to, I'm your person. Okay? Always. Always. And um, do you have any final words before we complete this interview? I don't know if it's something that can be added. Um... I Please. keep forgetting random things. Um, Go ahead. My brother called my mom a few days before he went missing and said, Jessica will be okay. She asked what he meant, and he repeated mm-hmm. his statement and wouldn't mm-hmm. elaborate on what he was referring to, huh. which I think is part of the reason she was so worried once all this happened was why she went back to why he said that to begin with. Mm-hmm. Okay, so, so uh, I'm not sure what to make of that. Yeah. Okay. I don't know. I 
just want to know if he's at, or if he's not here anymore, just mm -hmm. anything. Okay. Jessica, I'm hoping I can help you with that. Uh, I'm hoping that uh, you get this, this FOIA goes through. I hope that they give you as much as they can. I'm hoping that, um, you know, we'll reveal some things that you don't know right now. Oftentimes they do, sometimes they don't. And if should you get this FOIA, uh, I'm certainly welcome, you know, to look at it with you. If you, you know, want to send me a copy or something, I will look at it as well to give you my best, you know, advice, insight into whatever's in it. Okay? You know, being that this will be your first one time looking at all these reports, and I have at least a little of experience in that area. Yeah. Okay. And I appreciate you being on this episode of Unfound. Thank you very much. You're welcome, Jessica. And that was my January 12th, 2022 interview with Jessica Porter, sister of Paul Sanders. I thank her for joining me and all of you on this episode. As I stated during the interview, I've made a video showing the huge distance between Mesa, Tucson, and the Santa Catalina Mountains where the truck was found. Please go to the Unfound podcast channel on YouTube to watch it. At the beginning of this episode, I made the point that Unfound has covered two other disappearances, well, technically three, in which police chases were involved. And in neither of those is there a concern that the missing people weren't in the cars. Even in Molly and Colt's case, there are certainly questions about what happened after the chase was over. But there are no believable allegations that they weren't in the car with Nip. For Brennan's, there's actual video of him running off. With Paul's disappearance, we don't have such clarity. We don't know if he was in his own truck or not, thus making his case in that way much different from these others. The big issue? Even if he was in his truck, that doesn't explain how the truck ended up where it was and where Paul is. Yet, allow me to list the reasons you might or might not think Paul was the driver that August 14th, 2001 day. Here are some reasons to think the driver was Paul. It was his truck. When the truck was found, his stuff was in it. We have no forensic evidence, at least as far as the public knows, to say someone else was driving the truck. In the last 20 years, no one has ever come forward to say that Paul allowed someone to borrow his truck or that someone stole it from him and harmed him in the process. Now, here are some reasons to think that Paul was not the driver. In the last 20 years, no one has ever said that Paul ever went to the Tucson area over the year he lived in Mesa. The cigarettes in the truck have never been connected to Paul or anyone who usually drove the truck. Why would Paul run from police since he had no criminal record, he had a license, registration, and insurance, and nothing illegal or criminal like an opened beer can was found in the truck? At least one of his friends has acted suspiciously when asked about Paul's disappearance. So which set of facts is more convincing to you? I'm just hoping the covering of this disappearance can put Paul's family and trustworthy friends along with the police in hot pursuit of the truth once again. I'll leave the theorizing up to you. And that's the program. If you found it informative, please go to the app that you use to listen to Unfound and give this podcast a nice review. I thank you for listening. I'm Ed Denzel, and you've been listening to Unfound.